Extrasensory perception, or ESP, refers to information that is perceived outside of the five senses. This includes phenomena such as telepathy, clairvoyance, and knowledge of future events. Since these phenomena cannot be overtly seen or measured, they are often disregarded by the scientific community. However, recent research explores the possible biological mechanisms behind such phenomena. Many studies have demonstrated that we can read other people's minds. Telepathy refers to nonverbal communication, whether it be visual, intention, or emotions, and this extrasensory communication has been shown to be possible even at great distances. In 2007, psychology professor Gregor Domes and his colleagues found evidence that the ability to interpret subtle social cues can be enhanced by oxytocin, a hormone that increases trust and social approach behavior. It is not such a stretch to imagine that we can pick up the emotions and intentions of others around us, but how is this achieved when long distances separate people? Another 2014 study conducted by psychiatrist Carls Grau and his colleagues found that mental communication via the internet is possible. An experiment was conducted which proved that a person thinking of the words hola or chao in India could communicate this to people in Spain without saying it out loud, being seen, or typing it. Information can, in fact, be somehow transmitted across large distances between people who have only met over the internet and it seems to occur instantaneously. In 2005, biologist Rupert Sheldrake and his research associate Pam Smart recruited 50 experimental participants through an employment website. They also included four potential emailers and one minute before a prearranged time, the participants had to guess who would send it. Of the 552 trials, 43% of the guesses were correct. This is much higher than the 25% that one would have expected if the findings were just due to chance. There are those who claim to be able to demonstrate telepathic phenomena and they are sometimes referred to as mentalists. In 2008, psychiatrist Jenison Venkat Subramanian and his colleagues conducted a brain imaging study in which they prepared images for a mentalist and a control subject. The mentalist was able to produce an image very similar to the one prepared for him, whereas the control subject was not. These investigators have demonstrated that when a mentalist was successful, certain areas of the brain thought to play a role in memory were activated, whereas it was not activated in the control subject. The sample sizes in these studies were very small, and the findings have not been well replicated. That said, many scientists do believe that replication of any such finding is statistically feasible. If people have the capacity for telepathy, some people may be more capable than others, and openness to another person may play a role, as implied by the Octetocin study. This is an interesting clip about a girl in Iran that seems to have a telepathic link with her mother. Her telepathic abilities were so profound that we invited her, along with her mother and teacher, to give us a demonstration. How old are you now? I'm 12 years old. She will now recite what her mother writes on the board. Here, seven, good. Here, five, good. Four, and this, five. 
and this, seven. One day I noticed that she was duplicating her mother's writing and able to know what her mother was writing on the board without watching her. And I found this very amazing. So I asked her mother, do you know that she can read your thoughts? Now your mother will write something on the board and you tell us what it is, okay? First this, three. After that, ah. Uh. She's able to recite whatever her mother writes, numbers, words, or shapes and symbols. I couldn't understand what she says here. I'm doing the translating myself. My apologies. She can read whatever I put my intention on, whether it's a number I see on my cell phone, or if I look at a clock, without her seeing it, she knows what it is. For example, the exact time on the clock. So whatever you are focused on, she's aware of? Yes, yes. Can she read the thoughts of other people as well? She can if the other person shows something to me and I put my intention on it. Then she can telepathically understand as well. This 12-year-old girl can read her mother's mind even if she's not in the same room. They are from the city of Shiraz in Iran. It seems this phenomena can best be explained through a theory called morphic resonance as put forth by British biologist Rupert Sheldrake that describes the mind as existing or extending beyond the brain or limits of the surface of our bodies. The standard view in the academic world is that minds are brains and nothing but the activity inside the brain and all mental activities exist inside your head. Rupert proposes that our minds stretch out beyond our brains through fields, organizing fields involved with all forms of life, where a paranormal, distant influence can be exerted between individuals or groups through a morphic field, which can be compared to what is described in physics as quantum entanglement or what Einstein incorrectly dismissed as spooky action at a distance, where separated objects, or in this case people, somehow share an instantaneous condition or state. This non-local interaction of objects through a field, as is the case with magnets, for example, which have an invisible field that extends out far beyond the surface of the magnet, can also be said to exist in biological organisms and to related groups, such as a school of fish that seem to move together like a cohesive unit. They change direction so quickly, and in perfect unity, one can't help but suspect there's some sort of telepathic communication at play, or they're collectively adhering to some sort of invisible morphic field. It's clear that the biological predisposition to the transfer of thoughts is not limited to humans, as it can also be seen when flocks of birds turn seemingly automatically or wheel together. This quick inference from all birds at the same time seems to indicate a telepathic structure is at play, instantaneous and resembling a unified instinct. Oftentimes, pet owners also report having had experiences with their pet which they often describe as telepathic. For example, a dog sensing when their owner has set out to return home. This short clip is an interview with biologist Rupert Sheldrake in his own words. It depends what you mean by ethereal, but I think it's a field. I think these things work through what I call morphic fields. Yes. And morphic fields are fields. And um, in science, we have quite a number of fields. And there's the magnetic field around the magnet. It's, you can't yeah. see the magnetic field. It's in the magnet and it's around it. The gravitational field around the Earth. It's an invisible organizing structure that keeps the moon in its orbit and keeps us down on the ground. Yeah. Um, then there's the electromagnetic field of your cell phone, which is active inside the cell phone, but extends invisibly beyond it. And... Um, now, all of these are fields, and the point, fields were first introduced into science in the 1840s. They're not part of the original Newtonian mechanistic picture. And 
Um, most of our modern technologies are field-based technologies. I mean, yeah. right now we're talking on Zoom. The whole of this works on electromagnetic fields and transmissions and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think morphogenetic fields, probably the form-shaping fields and morphic fields, which is the generic term to cover form-shaping fields and yeah. behavioral fields and social fields, um, I think these are actual organizing fields, invisible organizing structures, they're patterns or regions of activity in space and time. And so it may sound, the fact they're invisible and they organize things invisibly, some people would say, oh wow, this must be pseudoscience, it's woo-woo and so on. But actually, that's the basis of the whole of modern science. The whole of modern science is explaining the visible in terms of the invisible. And once you get into quantum matter fields and uh, the quant zero point energy field and the Higgs boson field. Uh, uh, we're dealing with a whole range of fields which yeah. underlie yeah. reality. They're invisible. They give structure and order and form to things. Morphic fields is another kind of field. We've already got several kinds within science, uh, but I don't think it's yet an exhaustive list. Yeah, you give these, th those are very important examples in the n not only Earth's magnetic field, the gravitational pulls, the all of the technology in the last 150 years is now functioning off of these invisible fields to, to the human eye. This is very important. It's so true that in social groups, there's almost some sort of a, a amorphic field that happens if you've ever been around especially in like Northern California, what happens is you have uh, an extremely um, homogenized perspective about a specific topic. And you basically can't, you can't really enter a new idea into like a social group if they have a homogenized idea. And with athletes, there's something going on with athletes myself and one have played for so long different sports, especially in team sports, where there's some sort of a collective intelligence that's happening that is, it's, it's in a sense, it's, it's some sort of an extrasensory perception and th there's something going on between the teammates where they're able to be in complete surrendered flow to communication and sharing so ultimately rupert what we can have science do to further prove this is more randomized control trials around how our capacity to quickly learn around the world new ideas and so th this can be a way for science to further probe and understand that with all these examples um Yes, well, looking at social fields, um, yes, I think that there are fields that organize social groups, and I've looked at these in animals, because all social animals have social fields, they all have to coordinate members of the group. And when you look at flocks of starlings, for example, which we have here in England in the winter, huge flocks of up to a million birds, they fly around before dusk, um, and the whole flock can change direction it, almost immediately without the individuals bumping into each other. They know not only where the others are, but where they're going to go. And the same is true of schools of fish. And so there's something about animal groups. That they can be coordinated by some kind of invisible connection. And the best computer models of these flock behaviors treat them as as fields, as if they're a bit like iron filings in a magnetic field. Each individual iron filing is not doing the organizing itself, it's within a larger structure of which it's part. And I think members of social groups are like that. I think that's why you were talking about a kind of consensus views that you get in societies. I mean, scientific paradigms are like that. Thomas Kuhn pointed yeah. out that with it, at any given time, the scientists share a common model of reality, a paradigm. Um, and anything that doesn't fit in is dismissed or ignored or treated as heretical. But then there's a scientific revolution and another paradigm takes over another model of reality. Um, and then the same thing happens again. I mean, his, his um, model of scientific revolution was rather like sort of old style Latin American uh, military 
dictatorships, where you have a kind of dictatorship that's replaced by a different dictatorship. It wasn't scientific revolutions have involved replacing one dictatorship of ideas with another. They haven't, none of them's yet been like the Declaration of Independence, where the sort of democracy hits science. Uh, we're still in the old model of, um, you know, the, 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 at any given time. And right now, the dominant worldview is mechanistic materialism. Um, it's coming apart at the edges, and it's, uh, as I show in my book, Science Set Free, called The Science Delusion in the UK. Um, these dogmas of uh, materialism are actually being outgrown by science itself. We're going beyond them. So there's, there's a sense in which social fields constrain our thoughts. They also link us together and in team sports, um, they can lead to this coordination that's sort of unconscious and almost automated, sort of automatic. And Michael Murphy looked into this, you know, the founder of the Esalen Institute, who's very keen on, on looking at sports as an evolutionary phenomenon. And in his book, The Psychic Side of Sports, um, co-authored with Rhea White, he um, talks about how interviewing, he interviewed American football players, and a lot of them felt they were sort of telepathic with other members of the team, but none of them dared say so in the locker room because uh, they thought the others would think they were weird. Um, um, but the, this is going on all the time, I think, in, in uh, sports activities. And it's this connection between members of groups within the social field that underlies telepathic phenomena, like dogs knowing when their owners are coming home and mothers knowing when their baby needs them, uh, when they're miles away from the baby. Um, so I think we're linked together with uh, members of our families and members with, of other social groups through these social fields. While it's exciting to hear these new lines of thought coming from a biologist, these ideas are only new to the scientific community as they've been around for many millennia in the spiritual community, where consciousness is not solely regarded through the myopic perspective of mental function, but as belonging to a broader degree of awareness, as expressed in this short interview with Indian yogi Sadhguru. Sadhguru, many years ago, when my son was a little kid, he gave me a book written by Swami Vivekananda. He was describing how ancient gurus could communicate with each other thousands of miles away just by thought. It's essentially, it's like a modern internet, how one computer can communicate with another computer in the US or Europe, anywhere. Do you believe that human mind can be trained to influence another human mind or people's mind who are far away just by tuning our mind to the right frequency? Can it be trained? Can we, uh, can we uh, uh, learn that art? You're trying to beat the cell phone companies. <laughs> It's not just about the mind. See, when we say mind, the English word mind is only generally referring to only the thought process. Thought process is the most surface element of your mind. I think because of European thought, we have given too much significance to the thought. In the yogic science, we do not attach any importance to what you're thinking about or feeling right now because what can you think? Only the data that you have collected, you're recycling it. It's of no great consequence. Whatever is in the surface of your mind keeps rolling. That is not of any consequence. What you're thinking and feeling right now is very surface of mind. There are deeper dimensions of the mind. In Sanskrit language, there are many, many words to describe the different states of mind. But now there is one aspect of the mind, for lack of time and stuff, <laughs> I'll leave those things. There is one aspect of the mind which we refer to as chitta. Chitta is the innermost core of the mind, which is your connection with what we are referring to as consciousness. If your chitta becomes conscious, if your chitta acquires a certain level of conscious control, if you acquire, now you have access to your consciousness. What we are referring to as consciousness 
is that dimension which is neither physical, nor is it electrical, nor is it electromagnetic. It is a quantum leap from physical to non-physical dimension. A non-physical dimension being the lap of the existence. It is the non-physical in whose lap the physical is happening. Physical is a small happening. In this cosmos, not even two percent or not even one percent is physical, rest is non-physical. This non-physical dimension, in the yogic terminology, we use a specific sound which is connected with that dimension. Today it's all very highly distorted. We call this shi va, that means that which is not. We, when we say Shiva, we are not referring to some man sitting up there. We are talking about a dimension which is not, but it is in the lap of this dimension, everything that is happens. So if your chitta becomes even mildly conscious, your ability to not only communicate an idea or a thought, even to deliver something is possible, physically deliver something is possible. So, is it a possibility? Definitely it is. Right now, can we teach it to all these people? In theory, yes. But are they willing to work towards it? That's a question mark. One big problem is, our education systems are such, we have glorified our thought to such a place. First, to bring that down itself will take time. To make them understand the stupidity of their thought, it will take a whole lot of time because everybody thinks they're smart. But actually the smartest thing about most people is their phone <laughs> See, Because your thought process is just an outcome of the limited data that you have gathered. It doesn't matter if I have read the libraries of the world, still it is too limited compared to what it is, what the creation is. With all the scientific development, we still do not know how a leaf really works. We do not know how a single atom in its entirety we do not know with all the scientific exploration. So that… that should be humbling enough for everybody to know that we hardly… we know how to use things but we do not know what it is. It will take lifetime of attention to even grasp the fundamentals of what it is. So if people are willing to first of all understand like the whims of their heart, you just dismissed as dumb, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if they also understand the… the so-called smartness of their thought process and emotion is quite dumb, now it becomes easy. It becomes easy to train people that communication need… it's not like, now I want to generate this thought and give it to you, not like that. Things will happen to you before you think. What… what is best for you, will simply happen to you even before you articulate in your mind. You don't have to ever think what you want to become, how you want to be. Life will just arrange itself. An intelligence beyond what you can contain in this bone box starts working for you and it'll work. You've heard of Ramanujam and others just opened a window with their Devi and he becomes that kind of a mathematician which is, you know, even today they're… after one century they're still trying to figure out what he said and the, the mathematical calculations th that he gave is the backbone for describing the black holes in the universe. When he was there, there was no word called black hole, nobody knew there is such a thing. When we say black hole, what we are talking about is the curve of time and gravity, which is something modern science is battling with. He made mathematical background for that. As the curve increases, it… what is in existence, physical existence becomes non-existence. So this is what it is when we say yoga. You reduce the curve in such a way that what is largely physical becomes non-physical. Once it's non-physical, time and space is not an issue. Once time and space is not an issue, communication is simply there. My name is Robert Sepper, I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon. My books make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. 
please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts, so please leave a comment below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.